So good morning, everyone. My name is Meg Lambert. I'm a neuroscience nurse, and I uh, currently work for Medtronic, one of the device manufacturers. But prior to my joining Medtronic, I was with Barrow Neurological Institute as the deep brain stimulation program coordinator slash nurse for over a decade. So I have lots of experience with DBS. I personally have come in contact with over 1,200 DBS patients in my career. So today, what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is what is DBS? Who's a good candidate for DBS? How do we determine that? What does the surgery entail? What you can expect postoperatively. Later on today, the three device makers, Medtronic, Abbott, and Boston Scientific, are going to come in after me and talk specifically about the three devices. My purpose is today is just to inform you about DBS, okay? And they will get into the nitty gritty of the different devices and their features and benefits. All right. I always laugh. I can save a life, but sometimes I'm technologically challenged. Anyhow, what is DBS? Any of you know what DBS is? DBS is a surgical treatment that helps with some of the motor symptoms of certain movement disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and primary dystonia. Electrical stimulation is targeted to certain areas of the brain that we know house the circuits for movement. So people with movement disorders have unusual movement. It could be a tremor, it could be slowness, it could be stiffness, it could be twisting. So what happens is with the electrical stimulation, we can kind of correct those abnormal signals going through the brain so patients have more normal movement. DBS is not a cure for the disease, nor it is a treatment of last resort. We want to capture patients in their disease process where we know we can help them and we can deliver long quality of life by helping with those symptoms. Um, DBS works in conjunction with medication and with therapy many times. Um, so anyway, the next slide I wanna show you is a quick video on where DBS is actually placed in the body. So I just want you to look and see where the apparatus is actually placed in the brain, under the skin of the neck, and in the chest. DBS therapy uses a medical device, much like a cardiac pacemaker, and thin, soft, flexible wires called leads completely inside the body. While the device is implanted beneath the skin in the chest, the leads are implanted within the brain. Electrical stimulation is then sent directly to targeted areas within the brain. Stimulation of these areas enables the brain circuits that control movement to function better. This results in a reduction of some symptoms in many patients. All right, I'm going to pause it right there just so you can see. Again, the leads go into the brain, certain areas of the brain, and then under the skin of the neck is the connector. And down here is the battery or neurostimulator. Everything is under the skin. You can't see anything. And I promise you will not fall in the dark. Okay? So I just wanted to show you where the apparatus or the device is actually implanted in the body. So I'm going to give you a little brief history of deep brain stimulation. Back in the day, there was only one surgical treatment available for movement disorders and primarily for tremor control. It was called a thalamotomy or a pallidotomy, meaning the patient would be awake, the doctor would drill a little hole through the skull, place a wire in there, apply a little electrical stimulation, hope that the tremor stopped, and then zap, burn the brain tissue. That was the only surgical treatment available. You could only do one side of the brain. Sometimes patients had a stroke, sometimes it worked, but if you had horrible tremor, affecting your life. You couldn't dress yourself. You couldn't feed yourself. You couldn't eat. 
you couldn't do anything with your hands because your tremor is so bad, you would consider this a, what we call ablative surgery, where it actually burns the brain tissue. The problem was you could only do one side of the brain, you know, to affect one side of the body. Um, again, sometimes patients stroke, sometimes it worked, um, but you can only do one side. But if you had severe tremor, people would undergo this particular procedure. So back in 1987, there was a doctor in France, a doctor, Benavide, who did quite a few of these ablative surgeries, pallidotomy and thalamotomies. So one day, a light bulb went on in his head. He goes, wait a minute. Why are we burning viable brain tissue when we know if we apply a little bit of electrical stimulation to the brain, we can stop that tremor? It was the same time that they were developing cardiac pacemakers. So they took the same technology, applied it to the brain, and voila, DBS was born. In 1987, the first case was done in France. Came over to the United States in the 1990s. Of course, we have the FDA, went through all the clinical trials to prove it was not only safe, but effective. So in 1997, the FDA approved deep brain stimulation, or DBS, for essential tremor. In 2002, the FDA approved it for Parkinson's and in 2003 for primary dystonia. We also have approval to do DBS for um, epilepsy and for OCD. However, all, I'm only going to talk about movement disorders today. So the point of that slide is this is not new. This is not experimental. This has been FDA approved in this country for 25 years. So the DBS system, you saw in the video where the device is implanted into the brain, there are three specific pieces to the system. It's like modular furniture. The beauty of it is if you have to replace one of those parts, you don't have to take everything out. So the first part of the system is called the lead. The lead is that little tiny wire, and I apologize, I do not have one with me today, but the reps are going to show you later. It's a little tiny thin wire that goes down into the brain, to the area of the brain that we know house those nuclei that have the messages for movement. They're tiny, tiny little wires, and you'll see them later. On the tip, you'll see on the tip of these leads are little metal bands called contacts. Depending on the kind of device you get, you might have four contacts, you might have eight contacts. Contacts are where we send that electrical stimulation. So we can send it to this contact, we could send it to this contact, we could send it to these two contacts. It depends on your symptoms and what we're wanting to achieve with your symptom control. So this is where we send the electricity to one or more of these little metal bands that are placed on the tip of the electrode in the brain. Um, so you're going to hear that word a lot in your DBS journey. What well, contact are we going to turn on? I'm testing contact two. Oh, contact three seems to be working the best for you. So you're going to hear that word a lot. And what it means is these little metal bands on the tip of the lead that we place in the brain tissue. The next part of the system is called the connector or extension. It connects the lead or leads in the brain to the battery that's placed in the chest. Everything is under the skin. One person asked me one time, well, how do you get in the, that in there? You will have to open up, you know, make an incision in the neck. Absolutely not. What happens is during the surgery, they make a little incision right here behind the ear, free up the tails of the leads, and I'll show you that later. Um, and with a special instrument, glide it under the skin of the neck to the chest very much like we do for um, shunts. You know, people that have hydrocephalus or water on the brain, how we put the shunts in, the same kind of same kind of tool that we use. So it's very easy. We have a lot of play in our skin too, so it goes down there quite easily. So the extension or connector is what connects the leads in the brain to the battery in the chest. The next part of the DBS system, and I call this the brains of the operation, it's almost like a little mini computer in your chest. This is called many things. For simplicity's sake, we call it the battery. It's also called a neurostimulator, an internal pulse generator, or IPG. In some parts of the country, they call it the can. I was at a conference one, and somebody said, what's the most popular can that you guys use? I said, excuse me? I don't know what you're talking about, but here in Arizona, we call it the battery. 
for simplicity slate. Like I said, this is the brains of the operation. This, we, the clinicians, tell it how much electricity to send to the brain, which contacts to light up, how much, how often, and the frequency of it. So it generates and controls the therapy stimulation and is implanted typically right under the skin of the chest. They don't cut the muscle. So you can see there's a variety of different shapes and sizes and the reps are gonna show you examples later. So there's two types of batteries available to you. One is called the non-rechargeable or the recharge-free battery. I call it the Crock-Pot model. Set it and forget it. Have your surgery, put the battery in, go about your business for three to five years. Your battery starts to wear down, much like your car battery. And there's a way you can check it at home. And when you see your battery starting to wear down, you call the doctor and say, hey, I need to make an appointment to come in and talk about getting my battery replaced. It's as simple as that. So that's called the non-rechargeable or the recharge-free battery. Again, they last three to five years, depending on how much stimulation you're using will deplete your battery faster. Much like if you drive your car 100 miles a day, the battery under the, under the hood is probably going to deplete faster than somebody that only drives to the grocery store twice a week, right? So that's my analogy. The other type of battery available to you is the rechargeable battery. A rechargeable battery is exactly how it's labeled, rechargeable. You are in, uh, responsible for recharging your battery on a regular basis, much like you charge your phone or your laptop at home. The beauty of the rechargeable is it's smaller and thinner than a non-rechargeable because it doesn't have to hold a charge for three to five years. So it's smaller and thinner but you have to charge it up. And it's very simple to do. The rechargeable battery, not only is it smaller and thinner, it lasts for 15 years. But again, it's something that you have to embrace and something that you have to commit to. Um, I always tell patients, if you're gonna get a rechargeable, just incorporate that into something you do on a regular basis. For example, I read every night before I go to bed. I don't watch TV, I read a book. So I would likely sit up in bed with my book put my recharging apparatus on, click the button, sit there, charge up, read my book, take it off, go to bed, and I'm charged up usually for several days to a week. Now, again, it depends on your settings and your battery, how fast you're going to have to recharge. Some people do it once a week. Some people top it off every day. That's your prerogative. You can do that. It's not going to harm the battery. Some people do it every other day. But what we always ask you to do is just for the first three to four weeks when you have a rechargeable battery, just check it regularly to see how quickly you're depleting it so you can get in a rhythm of knowing how frequently. Because you don't want to let it go down to a zero charge because then your symptoms are going to come back. Then you're going to have to sit for a couple of hours and charge up. So anyway, rechargeable, smaller, thinner, 15-year lifetime, non-rechargeable, three to five years, then you come back and have it changed up. Now. If you start out with a non-rechargeable battery and it's time for you to get changed and you say, you know what, I think I want that rechargeable, you can do that. You can change it. So where's the battery placed? It's typically on your non-dominant side and most people are right-handed, so many times we'll put it on the left side of the chest. Um, right under, so picture yourself lying down on a bed. Take your two fingers two fingers below your clavicle, which is this bone here, two fingers away from your sternum, which is this bone here. So it sits right about, on me, it would be right about here in my chest, okay? So that's typically where it goes. However, if you have a cardiac pacemaker, a defibrillator, if you have had breast cancer or lung cancer on one side or another, we will always put it on the opposite side. You can have a DBS, uh, neurostimulator and a defibrillator or a pacemaker. They just have to be on opposite sides of the chest, but it's not a problem to have both. We also think about what are your hobbies. I can assure you it's not going to hurt your golf swing either side. It's not going to hurt your ability to cast a, a fishing pole. Um, the only thing is if you shoot guns on a regular basis, we ask you to put the battery on the opposite side of where your gun stock lies because you don't want the recoil. But that's about it. That's the only thing. Also, we can also place the battery, I believe the Medtronic one, 
um, because you can get an extra long extension in the belly because some people are small in stature you know a little tiny petite woman that doesn't have a lot look at me i have a large body habitus i'm i'm not a small person but a tiny little woman she might not want to have a battery in her chest she might want to put it here or if you just love your body and don't want a scar we've had several patients that have said i don't want a scar on my chest put it there the only thing I caution you, if you put it in your belly, your post-op recovery is going to be a little bit more uncomfortable because think about every time you get up from a chair oh, or you sneeze, but that goes away and they settle in nicely and you forget they're even there. So that's an option for you if you choose to have it in your belly. So the types of DBS devices, there's three that are FDA approved. Medtronic was the first one approved in 1997, um, Abbott and Boston Scientific. They have been around 2000, I think 17 and 2018, they were approved. Um, they function the same manner by applying stimulation to those areas in the brain. However, they all have little different features and benefits and you'll see them and the reps will talk to you about them. Also, I would highly suggest you talk about uh, your, your choice with Dr. Evidente because eventually he is going to be programming your device and he might have some opinions. So patient selection for Parkinson's. How many people in the room today do we have, have Parkinson's? Okay, so good. Uh, Parkinson's disease. This is what we look for to determine if you're a good candidate for deep brain stimulation. Number one, you have to have a diagnosis of what we call idiopathic or true Parkinson's disease for four years or more. And the reason we say that is there's other diseases out there that look like Parkinson's early on, but they're not. So if you have somebody that has Parkinson's symptoms for a year or two and you do surgery on them and then it morphs into that other disease, it's not going to help you. So we want to wait and be sure that you have Parkinson's. Secondly, we want to make sure you're still responsive to your medication. Um, so have any of you had on-off testing yet where you come in off your medication, you have that test, tap your fingers, open and close your fist, walk up and down. Up, yep. So you know what I'm talking about. And then we score it, and it's a functional exam. We want to see how you function without your medications. Then you have your medications, wait till they kick in. We test you up again to see if you have an improvement in your function. That tells us that you are likely going to be a candidate for DBS. There are some things we do take in consider. We know that some medications do not really help with Parkinson's tremor. So we take that in consideration with the scoring downward. Yeah, and also just because you're taking more medication more frequently doesn't mean your meds are not working. It just means you need more medication, you need it more frequently. And I'm gonna show you a slide about that. They're called motor fluctuations. Motor fluctuations, it's when you take your meds, they wait till they kick in. Oh, you feel good for about an hour and then it drops off. My dad had Parkinson's. And we called it Daddy's Roller Coaster Day. He lived by his medication. He would make doctor's appointments at 2 p.m. And I have to be on time because I know my meds are going to wear off by 3 o'clock. So we called it the Roller Coaster Day. That is motor fluctuations. So with, with candidates for DBS with Parkinson's, number one, you have to have Parkinson's disease, idiopathic Parkinson's disease for four years or more. Number two, still be responsive to your medication. And number three, we look for one or more of these other symptoms, the motor fluctuations, or perhaps trauma, uh, prominent tremor, or dyskinesias. Do you know what that means, that word dyskinesias? Anybody ever seen Michael J. Fox, the wiggly? That's dyskinesias. That's from high doses of medication. He still needs all those meds. He can still function with those meds, but he does the little wiggly dance. That's dyskinesia. So we look for one or more of the following. Motor fluctuations, prominent tremor, and dyskinesia. And you know, you don't have to have a tremor to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. That's a, a misnomer that a lot of people um, believe. My dad didn't have tremor, and he had Parkinson's. So motor fluctuations, tremor, or dyskinesia. So this is one of the patients, um, I believe that was one of Dr. Evidente's patients. He made this graph and you can see he gets up in the morning, he takes all those meds, they're down on the bottom. 
you can see the graph, he starts to feel better, he's on for a little bit, and then he drops off. So you can see that and in between those valleys there, he has dyskinesias and he has tremor. So he had DBS, and this is what happened. It smoothed out. No more roller coaster day. It just smoothed out. His dyskinesias and his tremors went away. So this is what could happen as a result of DBS. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm sure there's a few people on our, um, our Zoom that might have essential tremor. So I'm going to talk about that and tell you who is a good candidate for DPS with a diagnosis of essential tremor. Now, essential tremor is also a movement disorder. It is the most common movement disorder there is. There's more people suffering from essential tremor than there is from Parkinson's disease. However, we don't hear about it as frequently because it's familial. It means 50% or more of patients with essential tremor have a family member that also have tremor. The distinct difference between Parkinson's and essential tremor is Parkinson's disease is more or less a rest tremor. See, I'm sitting, I'm standing here, I'm resting, I'm not doing anything, but I'm moving. I have a tremor. Essential tremor. I'm standing here, perfectly fine, I'm not doing anything until I activate my muscle. So I go to activate my muscle and grab something, then I start to tremor. So there's a distinct difference. One is a rest tremor, one is an action tremor. So essential tremor is an action tremor. Also, essential tremor patients do not have the other cardinal features of Parkinson's. They don't have slowness and stiffness. So it basically is an action tremor. Sometimes it starts early in childhood, but sometimes it starts later in life, like after the age of 50. And it can start with just a little bit of a, my husband has a little bit of a, just a tiny little flicker, you know? Um, or it could be so badly that that person can't do anything. So essential tremor. We ask our patients to try at least two medications. And if those medications are not working or if they cause terrible side effects and that tremor is affecting your quality of life, you are a good candidate for deep brain stimulation therapy. So don't let anybody, those of you with essential tremor, don't let anybody tell you your tremor is not bad enough. Here's, a, here's an example of what I'm talking about. We had a gal who came in she went to another uh, DBS center. She was told her tremor wasn't bad enough. She had essential tremor. Well, guess what? Nobody asked her what she did for a living. She said jewelry, okay? So you have this fine little tremor. She couldn't do her job anymore. We had another woman who was a potter. That was her, that was her craft. That's what she loved to do. She couldn't even do that anymore because she had this fine tremor and she couldn't use her, her kiln anymore. So when your tremor is affecting your quality of life, it's time to consider DPS. Although we ask you to try at least two medications, the medications are not dampening your tremor or they're giving you lousy side effects. As an aside, there are no tremor meds on the market. Every med that's given for essential tremor is what we call a secondary medication, meaning it is for something else. It could be for nerve pain, it could be for seizures, it could be for your heart. So with those kind of meds come a whole host of side effects. So that's what we look for in essential tremor patients. Now, dystonia. Anybody know what that means? Dystonia, primary dystonia. Have you ever seen anybody walking around like this with their head and their neck like this? That is called cervical dystonia, cervical spine. Dystonia is an involuntary twisting of the muscles and it can be quite painful and there's very few um, treatments for this type of movement disorder. So again, patients have primary dystonia. When I say primary, I mean it's the diagnosis. There's other patients that may have a secondary dystonia related to something else. It could have been from a head injury. It could have been from a drug overdose. But we're looking for people that have primary dystonia. That's their primary diagnosis. So you've tried medications and very few, maybe baclofen, maybe a little bit of Botox. That's about it. Sometimes physical therapy, occupational therapy. But when you've tried medication or therapy and it's not helping your dystonia and your dystonia and those symptoms are causing you undue pain and affecting your quality of life, it's time to consider deep brain stimulation therapy. So other considerations, 
um, when we look at patients for DBS, you just can't show up at the doctor and go, hello, I'm here, I want brain surgery. No, we don't do that. We're very thoughtful. So we look for patients that are in overall general good health. We want you to get medical clearance from your specialist, meaning if you have, you're under the care of a pulmonologist, a hematologist, you have diabetes, we just want to get a letter from the specialist saying, I understand this patient is going to have surgery and it's okay with me. They're healthy enough to undergo the surgery. Um, we want patients who are available for DVS programming and medication management after the device has been implanted. So if you live in rural New Mexico and don't have transportation, we're going to think twice about putting a medical device in your body. We want you to be able to follow up with the physicians. Also, we look for patients that have family or community support systems because following um, the initial surgery when the leads are placed in the brain, we, when you're discharged from the hospital, we want you to have some supervision at home for a couple of days. It's just for your safety. Now, he, we, we understand that sometimes people don't have that available to them. They don't have a family member or a friend that can help them for the first couple of days that they're home. So in that case, we sometimes will pre-plan and have those patients be discharged to an inpatient rehab so they can get their medications. They can have supervision. So that's the exception, not the rule. But I just want to let you know that just because you don't have community or family support doesn't mean you can't undergo the surgery. It's just that we help you find um, resources for supervision. So what can DBS improve? Tremor. Rigidity, slowness, motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, and dystonic movement, that dystonia I talked to you about. Now, we also have seen in Parkinson's patients that they sometimes have dystonic features, meaning curling of the toes or cramping of the arms and the hands. DBS can help with that. So these are the things we can say DBS can improve. Less likely to improve balance, walking, freezing of gait, trouble with speech or swallowing, depression, anxiety, or cognitive challenges. However, if these seem, symptoms seem to improve with your medication, maybe you'll get an improvement with DBS, but this is something to discuss with Dr. Evidente. I can only promise you that we can help with these symptoms. If you get an improvement with any of these, it's a plus. So goals and expectations. We don't want you going in thinking that when you have DBS surgery, you're going to come out like, um, you know, some kind of a robot where you can do anything. Um, if you've never run the Boston Marathon, you're not going to run it after DBS surgery unless you were in shape. So here's an example of realistic expectations. Let's say you have tremor and you just want to be able to eat in public, you want to be able to hold a cup of coffee, you want to be able to button your shirt, or if you have Parkinson's, here's a classic. I had a patient named Joe. He said, all I want to do is get out of bed at night, and not have to wake up my wife to help me because I'm always so slow and stiff with this Parkinson's. That's a realistic expectation. Or the fellow that was still working in a grocery store, he was an assistant manager. And every morning he'd go to work and he'd walk the store, you know, with the dairy guy and the grocery guy and the fruits and vegetables guy. And he always felt that he was slow and he would hold them back. He goes, I just want to walk my store. I just want to, I don't want to be so slow. I don't want to be so stiff anymore. I feel like I'm holding my employees back. That's a realistic expectation. So I want you to think about what do you want to get out of the surgery? What symptoms are bothersome to you? What do you want to improve? Talk to your doctor about that. Talk to Dr. Evidente because sometimes in Parkinson's disease, depending on your symptoms, he might choose one area or another area in the brain to put those leads. So evaluation for DBS, a discussion with your physician. You're all here. You've likely had this discussion with Dr. Evidente already or you wouldn't be here. Some physicians get an MRI of the brain early on just to rule out that you don't have something else, but it's not really required because an MRI is going to be performed right before surgery. On-off testing for Parkinson's patients, we want to make sure that you're still responsive to medication. Patients undergo what's called a neuropsychological exam prior to surgery. The basis of that exam is to determine whether or not you have dementia 
or underlying clinical depression or anxiety issues because we take a, an oath, do no harm. So we are not gonna put wires in the brain of somebody that needs treatment for those things. We wanna make sure that you're stable. Um, also, we wanna make sure you have enough cognitive reserve because after surgery, when you're being programmed, you have to participate. You have to be able to tell your doctor how you're feeling, how does this feel, well, how was your day last week, what did you do? Um, so we want people with cognitive reserve. Now, please don't be um, disappointed or frightened if you get the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or MCI after the neuropsych exam. It doesn't mean you can't undergo the surgery. It just means that you know, you're slowing down in a couple areas. It could be word finding. It could be um, executive functioning or problem solving. It could be short-term memory. As we age, sometimes these things naturally happen, but also in the setting of Parkinson's disease, because of the disease, you might test out with MCI. And again, do not be frightened with that diagnosis. Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Robin, who does Dr. Evidente's neuropsych testing, she will explain everything she's doing and what her findings are to you. And again, we're only looking for dementia, Alzheimer's, um, cognitive, severe cognitive impairment, uh, anxiety, or clinical depression. Oh, and a neurosurgery consultation, that's part of the package too. Um, typically, after you have your auto testing and your neuropsych, You'll go and see the neurosurgeon. Dr. Evidente usually refers down to Barrow to Dr. Francisco Ponce, and that is uh, where he will likely refer you for surgery. Uh, physician consensus. This is something that's very important. Some DBS centers don't do this, but I think it's a very important thing. Dr. Evidente, uh, Dr. Robin, Dr. Ponce, they all get together and they sit and they discuss every single patient before surgery to make sure that everybody's on the same page and everybody's in agreement that you are a good candidate. It's kind of like a three-legged um, stool, neurology, neuropsychology, and neurosurgery. Everybody has to be in agreement before they move forward. And again, we take that oath, do no harm. This is an elective surgery, uh, meaning it's not a life-threatening surgery. It's a quality of life surgery. So we want to make sure that you're a good candidate before we offer it to you. Also, they will discuss at this meeting not only are you a good patient, where, what part of the brain or what target those leads are going to go in, what kind of battery you want, where do you want it, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody's on the page, same page. So like I said, depending on your symptoms with Parkinson's disease, Dr. Evidente might determine that one area of the brain is better to put that lead in than the other. So there's two areas of the brain for Parkinson's that are used. One is the subthalamic nucleus or STN. It's a little, little bitty, tiny little area in the brain. And it's typically used for patients that, that have a lot of tremor. Um, the other area is the GPI, globus pallus interna. It also will treat all the Parkinson's symptoms, uh, may see a medication reduction also with the STN. And Sometimes it's recommended for patients that have MCI, but the jury is out on that. Programming takes longer with the GPI because it's a larger structure and it takes a little bit longer for the stimulation to really um, saturate the brain. With the STN, because it's a small little structure, you can get results right away. So I'm going to show that. Now with the STN, I'm obligated to tell you that if we do bilateral, meaning both sides of the brain, and you have to crank up the stimulation super, super high to make those symptoms get better. There is a possibility that you could have a little bit of softness and slurriness to your voice. However, we have so many tools in our toolbox and so much advanced technology now that we can do programming techniques to avoid that. But I'm still obligated to tell you there is a very, very minor chance that you could experience that after STN. Both sides, high, high settings. Here's an example. Uh, it's a sunny day in Sun City. Softness and slurriness in my voice. I might sound like this. It's a sunny day in Sun City. Do you see I'm softer and I'm a little slurry? But again, we have so many tools in our toolbox today that it's very rare that we see that, but I still have to tell you it's a minor possibility. Now, for essential tremor, we use an area of the brain called the ventral intermedius of the thalamus, and that's the only place where we'll put that lead for tremor. 
and it only reduces tremor. That's why we don't typically use it for Parkinson's because it's only for tremor. Parkinson's, there are other symptoms with it that we have to take into account. Again, it might affect your speech and maybe a little bit of your balance. If we do both sides, crank it up. But again, we have all these different tools and technology available to us to avoid those side effects. Dystonia. We typically use the GPI, Globus pallidus interna. It is usually most effective when we put two leads in the brain for dystonia. Now, this is a picture of your brain in half. I just want to show you where that area of the brain, down in here, that's where we place the leads. And you can see the STN is that little tiny white area. Like I said, it's a tiny little nubbin. Next to it in the green to the left, that is the GPI. And then that large pink area is called the thalamus. And the area of the thalamus that we use for essential tremor is called the VIM. Ventral, meaning to the side, intermedius, meaning in the middle of the thalamus. So those are the areas of the brain that we use. So you can see it's a very small area of real estate in your brain. So I talk about bilateral, unilateral, meaning one side versus two sides, one lead versus two leads. Um, we look for the uh, prominence of the symptoms, surgical tolerance, surgical benefit. What I mean by surgical benefit is maybe somebody has a central tremor and it's really only on their right hand. That's really only this side that's bothering them. And so they might say, I just want that fixed. So you only do one side. You're going to put one lead in. But typically with Parkinson's, typically with dystonia, and more frequently or not with essential tremor, Dr. Evidente recommends both sides. Now, if you put both leads in, doesn't mean you have to turn both of them on at the same time. You can keep one off until those symptoms start to get worse on the other side, then you can put it on. But um, there's a whole lot of uh, considerations here. However, I can say the majority of the patients have both sides done. Now, just so you know, when you're getting programmed, let's say I'm programming you, and I say, okay, I'm gonna check your left STN. How's your right hand feeling? I don't want you to be confused because in the brain, the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. The left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. It crosses over. It's the only part. Your, your spine's not like that. It's just your brain. So don't be confused. So which device to implant? Again, Medtronic since 1997, Abbott since 2016, and Boston since 2017. The reps are going to be here later to discuss the features and benefits of all of their devices with you. Um, this is in your packet. This is just a quick and dirty graph of some of those features and benefits. So surgery is scheduled. You've, you've jumped through all the hoops. You've passed all the tests. Surgery is scheduled. What happens next? Um, Dr. Evidente typically sends his patients to Dr. Francisco Ponce at Barrow Neurological Institute. However, Dr. Um, Ponce also operates at Honor Health Osborne campus. So for those of you that are familiar with the Honor Health system and more comfortable, he'll do your surgery there. And I can assure you a couple of years ago, when he started doing surgeries there, I personally went over with him and we trained all the staff on what the expectations were to uh, care for a DBS patient after surgery and they do a marvelous job as well. So um, prior to surgery, the staff is going to schedule all of your pre-op testing, which will include an MRI and a CT of the brain, EKG chest x-ray labs. You'll have an internal medicine consult just to say, yes, you're healthy enough to undergo surgery. The office will already get pre-op clearances from your, that's what they do. They reach out to your specialist and get those letters and say, yep, that patient's okay, good to go. And they'll get in, uh, you'll get in specific instructions on what medications and over-the-counter drugs to stop prior to surgery. For example, if you're on Coumadin, you usually have to stop for 10 days. If you're on Eliquis, it's usually 72 hours. Um, if you're taking, I think, uh, fish oil and some over-the-counter things, they ask you to stop for 10 days prior. So you get a whole list of what medications to stop and when. Now, this is a picture of a planning MRI of the brain. This is very important because it helps Dr. Ponce get to the target in your brain and hit the target exactly. Nobody's brain is the same. There's no map. There's no instructions that say, okay, go two inches down and four inches to the left. It doesn't work like that. 
It's your brain and everything is customized. So he takes that MRI of the brain, puts it up on his planning station or stealth station, and mathematically will plan the trajectory of how he's going to put those leads in your brain, avoiding the ventricles and major blood vessels, and hit that target. So you can see this. Now I want you to know, look at those lines. They are not symmetrical. Our brains are not symmetrical. So this is custom for every single patient. When I worked for Dr. Ponce, his planning station was outside of my office, and it was like he would come at the end of clinic, and he'd sit down there, and he'd do his homework every night for the next day, he'd sit there and plan that target for every single patient he was going to operate on. So the day of surgery, again, you're going to get detailed instructions from the, from the office, where to go, what time to be there, what to bring, et cetera, et cetera. Usually it's nothing to eat or drink after midnight. Parkinson's patients are always told, please bring your meds from home with you in the original labeled bottles or box. The reason is sometimes certain drugs like uh, Ritari, I know for a fact, is not on any hospital formulary. So they don't want you to interrupt your regularly scheduled Parkinson's meds while you're in the hospital. So you bring them in the labeled bottle so the pharmacist in the hospital can say, yep, this is legit, this is good, and you can take your meds from home. Yeah, right. right. The DVS surgery, there's two ways of doing surgery. There's a sleep under general anesthesia, which is Dr. Ponce's preferred method of doing DVS surgery. And then there's the traditional awake procedure where a patient is awake for intraoperative testing. And Dr. Ponce will go into great detail when he consults with you about how he does his surgery. So, DBS surgery is actually done in two parts. One is when the leads are placed. That is an inpatient procedure. You're in the hospital one to two nights, and then typically a patient will go home. Then you come back, back 10 to 14 days later to have the battery placed in your chest and hooked up to those leads as an outpatient. And you go home that same day. The reason you have to do it in two stages is Medicare reimbursement. This is inpatient, this is outpatient. They do not pay for inpatient and outpatient on the same day, they deny it. So that's the only reason why you have to have it done in two stages like that. But again, one to two nights in the hospital, and then the second one for the battery. It usually takes about an hour to hook everything up and put the battery in there and you go home the same day. So the surgery. You're going to come into pre-op, they're going to start an IV, they're going to give you a little something, something to make you comfortable, put you in your happy place, take you in the back, get you all nestled up onto the OR table, and then the next thing you're going to do when you're asleep is scrub up your head and put that frame on your head. I know it looks very archaic, but it's an integral part of the surgical procedure. The frame goes on your head, so the first thing he's going to do is he's gonna take you and do a CAT scan right in the operating room. There's a big apparatus in the operating room called an O-arm, and I'll show you a picture of it. So you're there, you got the frame on your head, they're gonna zip you into it, click, zip you out, and Dr. Ponce is gonna take that CT and his planning MRI and fuse them together, so he now has a 3D picture of what your brain looks like. So then he can make little changes to his trajectory if he needs to do so before they start. Once that's done, they're going to put the arc on the frame, and you can see this arc is all numeric. Now, when Dr. Ponce plans the trajectory, he does it mathematically with um, X, Y, Z coordinates. There's three different numbers. I think X, Y, Z. I think that's how it goes. Anyway, they correspond to the numbers that are on this, this um, arc right here. So he knows exactly the angle and the depth of how he's going to put those, that electrode into the brain tissue. Now, your head's been scrubbed up. He's going to clip a little hair. We do not shave. Clip a little hair right here. Make a semicircular incision. Flap back the skin. And then do what's called a burr hole. Take a tiny little drill and drill through the skull. Because skull is bone, you have to have the bone removed to put that little lead in. 
it's about the size of a dime. And then once that's done, they'll put the lead in here, put it down exactly the way he has the XYZ coordinates. Then they do the other side if you're having both sides done. And then before they close, they're gonna do another CT in the operating room and take that and put it over the plan and he can see without a shadow of a doubt exactly where those leads are placed, okay? The goal is to be within two millimeters of your plan target. So I want you to picture a dartboard, you know, the little center black, no matter where you hit in the black, you get 10 points or 100 points. That's our goal, two millimeters right there. So he wants to get within two millimeters of his plan. And I used to do all his stats. When I did his stats, his average was 0.6 millimeters to plan. Do you know how tiny that is? Tiny, 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 tiny. Anyway, so that's how he does it. And then once it's a go, those leads are in the right place, they're gonna put a little plastic cap in that burr hole that's gonna hold that lead in place. So the lead is gonna come up. The end of the lead is gonna be tucked under the skin of the scalp. And the plastic cap is there in that burr hole They'll flap back the skin, close with staples. And that little lead, the tail of the lead is what I call it, gets tucked under the skin of the scalp and it just stays there safely until the next surgery. So see, you're gonna go home with two little smiley faces and he closes with staples. So you're gonna have two little shiny smiley faces. So I'm gonna go show you this. This is what it looks like when that CT and the MRI are fused together. The purpose of this slide is to show you that technology is so advanced now with intraoperative imaging that we can see the brain and we can see all those little blood vessels and everything in the brain to make sure that this procedure is done safe and correctly. And see here, there's all the numerical numbers there that correspond with the uh, trajectory. This is the OR. This is what's used in the operating room for the intraoperative CT. You're on that operating room bed. You, they go, you stay like this. This comes over you, snap, and then it goes back. This is a great piece of equipment, especially in a trauma hospital, having it right in the operating room. That's a picture of the electrode cap, and the reps are going to show you what they actually look like. But I want you to picture this. The lead is in the brain tissue. It's coming up like that. It goes through the center, sits in a trough, and then this top part comes on, clicks into place, and two little screws there into the, the uh, skull bone hold everything in place so it won't move. This is the tail, and this gets tucked under the skin of the scalp. So the second surgical procedure, you come back in 10 to 14 days later. When you are um, asleep, he will take out the staples in your scalp. And then what he's gonna do is make a little incision right here behind the ear, free up those tails that are nicely placed under the skin, connect them to those connectors like I described before and with a special instrument, just glide it down under the skin of the neck to the chest, make a small incision on the chest, place the battery, connect everything up. He'll close the staples here and staples here. So you'll go home with a couple more staples. And that's how it's done. It takes about an hour and you'll be in the hospital for a couple hours, but you do go home that day. So any questions on how the surgery is done? Okay. Uh, what you may experience postoperatively after the lead placement, the first surgery. You could have a honeymoon period, meaning you wake up the next day after surgery, your, your symptoms are better. It's like, how is this happening? I don't even have this battery in my chest yet. What happens when the leads are placed in the brain, the brain tissue swells up ever so slightly and gives off these little electrical charges that sometimes mimic the effects of DBS. It's almost like a natural DBS. And it's great if you have a honeymoon. If you don't, you don't. But please continue to take your medications because as the swelling goes down, your symptoms are going to be back to where they were before surgery. Headaches, right? You just had a procedure on your brain. However, up here is going to be numb for several weeks. Most patients complain of pain here and here because of that frame being on your head. So you're going to be given pain medicine in the hospital. Ice is your friend. You can put ice on it. Uh, also, you would know the rule about narcotics, right? 
Nobody can hand you a paper prescription anymore for narcotics. You are going to be called in. They will verify your pharmacy with you when you're in the hospital, and they will send it electronically to your pharmacy, any narcotic order. Okay, if, by the way, you are one of those patients that doesn't do well with certain narcotics or drugs, please tell the doctors they can write for something different. Um, cognitive changes. This is why we want somebody to be home with you for the first couple of days at home. You could experience this. Not everybody does, and we can't predict who will, but confusion, attention problems, word finding difficulties, short term memory, kind of slurry speech. It, it's, it can happen, and we just want you to be safe. That's why we want somebody with you. If um, you don't experience that, good. We can't, again, we can't predict who might experience this. Um, you could have some worsening of your balance or walking anytime you do surgery in the brain. It could throw off your equilibrium, so please be aware of that. You know, small dogs, throw rugs, et cetera, just be mindful of that. And swelling around the eyes. In the operating room, you're flat. You're down here at zero, we call it zero degrees. Oh, I said that one day in a class, a woman raised her hand. She goes, do you keep it that cold in the OR? I said, oh, I'm so sorry. Zero degrees means you're flat on the bed. Because of gravity, you could pull some tissue fluid around your eyes. It's perfectly normal. You also might even have a little bit of black and blue or bruising. Um, it's nothing to be uh, alarmed about. The only time I would say be alarmed is if your vision is affected. So after your battery is placed, you could have some neck stiffness because of that instrument and those leads being placed. Now you can't see those leads. Even if you go like this, you may be able to see the outline, but usually no because they're so tiny. But you could have some stiffness. So Dr. Ponce's office is going to give you some neck stretching exercises to do. You want to avoid any scar tissue buildup along there. So do your neck stretches. Tenderness of the site of connector incision. I have to tell you, of all the patients I've talked to over the years, most patients complain that this is the most tender part of the surgery, believe it or not, especially if that's the side that you sleep on. So here's a tip for you. Get one of those travel pillows, neck pillows, sleep on it. It's going to cradle that area so there's no pressure on it for the first couple of days if you sleep on that side. Also, bruising at the the chest side and, and discomfort at the chest side, that's okay. You can use ice. Now, ladies. Here's another tip for you. Breast tissue can sometimes be heavy. So you don't want to go braless after surgery. What you should do is get a nice cotton sports bra that has like thick, thick and tear, not little straps, but thick straps here, cotton, that will give you some support so your breast tissue doesn't pull down on your incision and cause discomfort. Some people actually sleep in a recliner chair the first night or two after this if it makes them more comfortable. So post-op care, most patients spend one to two nights in the hospital and go home the next day. Like I said, you're going to get narcotics for pain. Ice is your friend as long as it's a clean ice bag. You can put it on your incisions. Uh, most patients are off narcotics by the third day after surgery, and if they need anything, it's Tylenol. Um, no driving for several weeks. Dr. Evidente will clear you to drive. Uh, you can shower three days after surgery, but no vigorous scrubbing of your scalp. And oh, for the ladies, considering the surgery, I forgot to tell you something. Please, if you color your hair, do it right before surgery, because we ask you not to put any chemicals on your head for six weeks following surgery. You don't want to put chemicals on an area that has healing skin. So just get your hair done right before surgery. Um, Use common sense. Don't put yourself in a position where you're going to fall. Like, don't go off a step stool, small dogs, scatter rugs. No submerging in pools or hot tubs for six weeks after the battery is placed because it takes six weeks for your um, skin to completely heal over. And we know chlorine doesn't kill everything. You can, you can fanny, you know, fanny dump stuff. Um, no push, pull, or lift greater than 10 pounds for about four to six weeks after the surgery. Um, on the chest because you don't want to open up that incision and do your neck exercises. So reasons patients might require more than one night in the hospital. I was saying when the leads are placed, you could spend one to two nights in the hospital. Statistically, these are the reasons, believe it or not. Number one is urinary retention. 
you have a brain procedure and you can't empty your bladder. Why is that? As we age, we don't metabolize anesthetic agents or narcotics like we did when we were 25. And as we age, both men and women sometimes have difficulty emptying their bladders. It's just a process of aging. So coupled with those two factors, boom, you might not be able to empty your bladder completely. So they're going to keep you an extra day just to make sure you can avoid. Nausea and vomiting is the number two reason. Um, if you're the kind of person that does not do well, like I said, narcotics or anesthetic agents, please tell the doctors. They can give you something different or they can give you some medication before they wake you up to help avoid that phenomenon. Confusion is the number three reason. I talked about that. You could have those cognitive kind of issues after surgery. If we find that you're a little odd the day after surgery, we're not going to send you home right away. We're going to wait another day to make sure you start to clear. And number four is pain. Even though this is not a painful procedure, it's an uncomfortable procedure, everybody's pain level is different. So your pain isn't being managed to your expectations. They will keep you extra just to make sure your pain is under control. Number five is age. This is only statistically. If you're over the age of 70, you will likely experience one through four more than somebody who is younger than you. But it doesn't mean you're going to have these, but it means statistically you're more likely to. So these are incisions. You can see that top left. That is a head. That is when that patient came back to have the battery replaced. You can see very little hair is clipped and how nicely that healed with those staples. That's a chest incision. That's about 10, 14 days afterwards. That's your magic window to get your staples out, 10 to 14 days. Um, you can see that. I put that picture up there because you can see there's a little bruising. What can happen? Also, it's pink. Do you see that? That's not infection. That's the body screaming, get these out of here. And this... Gentlemen, you can see his outline of his incisions. That's 30 days after surgery. I always laugh and say we gave him uh, a discount because we didn't have to clip any hair. <laughs> but they heal beautifully. Your skin heals beautifully with staples. So surgical risk, Dr. Ponce will go over these in detail with you. But the number one surgical risk of any procedure is infection. And you can see that these are based on his statistics. Um, his uh, Surgical risks and complications are extremely low. Um, I want to describe to you seizures. Some patients, very few, had post-op seizures. It was at one time isolated incidents, and they think it was from when those brain cells swell up and give off those little charges. It triggered a seizure. So it was a one-time event, no additional seizures, but it's kind of scary sometimes, so we have to tell you what could happen. Stroke-like symptoms, patients wake up, half their bodies flaccid, it's like, uh-oh, stroke, do a CAT scan, there's no stroke. But what they saw is the track where that lead goes into the brain, it's swollen. And what happens when it swells, it presses up on an area of the brain called the motor strip. So if I press up, or up over here, this side of the body is going to get a little weak. But as the swelling goes down, function returned 100%. Um, bleeds. Half of these were bleeds were, that were asymptomatic. So what they called, they would see a subdural hematoma. Dr. Ponce checks you before you leave the recovery room with another CAT scan. And what they do is they found some subdural hematomas. It's almost like a bruise. You know how you hit your hand turns purple? Well, that happens under here, subdural. And it's just a collection of brain. Uh, it's a little bit of blood there, like a bruise. Uh, half the people were asymptomatic. Half the people had some kind of symptoms, and they just watched, and they went away. Um, bleeds. There were oh, also with bleeds, there was one patient that I recall that had a more extensive bleed, and he ended up going to inpatient rehab. And he still has a little bit of residual weakness on one side, but that is like the outlier. And then ischemic stroke, he had two patients uh, with ischemic strokes, which are what we call dry strokes versus hemorrhagic or bleeding strokes. It means that oxygen or blood flow did not get to certain areas of the brain during surgery or after surgery. So those brain, that little bit of brain tissue kind of died. And so they had stroke-like symptoms. So they both those gentlemen went to inpatient rehab and did great. So, but he's going to go over these in, in depth with you, what the risks are. 
possible stimulation related consequences. You can have a little weight gain. Sorry, I'm the bearer of bad tidings. But the reason is after surgery, let's say you are a tremor predominant person or you have dyskinesia, you're burning calories, right? You take those symptoms away, you eat the same amount of ice cream, you're going to gain some weight. So just, just be aware of that. Mood changes. Deep down in the brain, the little nuclei for mood are in the same basic area, neighborhood, as the nuclei for movement. So stimulation could leach out, could cause a little moodiness, just tell Dr. Vedente, or Parkinson's patients, he will most likely start taking your meds down. Um, certain Parkinson's meds, like levodopa, gives you a little, uh, a little oomph. So if he starts reducing those, you may get a little moodier, melancholy. Just let him know. And then speech changes. I talked about that, but again, we have so many tools in the toolbox and high-level technological things we can use to avoid that. So when you have your battery placed, you're going to get a parting gift. You're going to go home with a patient programmer. It's yours to keep. There's lots of things you should do with it, and the reps are going to go over that with you. Just so you know, you're going to get one of these to take home with you. So programming. Programming starts usually within a week after you have the battery placed. Dr. Abdente's office is always um, given your surgical dates, so they will reach out to you ahead of time and make those appointments for you. Um, what the objective in the first um, programming session is, remember I talked about those little contacts? Where they're going to check each and every contact to see which one reduces your symptoms the best without giving you any side effects. So it takes about an hour and a half that first session. But then the subsequent programming sessions are much less. So surgical treatment, uh, medical treatments, you may and may not have after DBS surgery. You may not have diathermy. Diathermy is DP, typically done for professional athletes. Some old chiropractic and physical therapy offices do it. What they do is they heat up the muscles and the organs. And if they heat up the wires and goes to your brain, it's not a good idea. So no diathermy. Um, Transcranial magnetic stimulation is when you sit under an MRI scanner and you have pulsation of magnetic force, and it's typically done for profound clinical depression, and I don't think any of you will ever be faced with this because we're not going to do surgery on you if you have profound clinical depression. Safeguards are needed for electric pottery. That's zapping the bleeders in the operating room, so we always say to you, best thing to do is just turn your device off before any surgery. Turn it off with your patient programmer, and then afterwards, when you're in your recovery room, you or somebody in your family can turn your device back on. Lithotripsy, that's banging those kidney stones. An example of a safeguard would be if they're using laser or ultrasound to pummel those stones, they would do it in a downward fashion on your kidney rather than pointing it up towards your chest. Therapeutic ultrasound, a lot of the physical therapies do that. You can, it's perfectly safe, but we ask them not to go within four inches of your battery or your connector. And MRIs, all the devices are MRI compatible. There's all sorts of safety warnings and things you need to do prior to having an MRI. The reps are going to go over that with you, but they are MRI compatible. Treatment and tests that are safe, CAT scans, x-rays, PET scans, fluoroscopy, and mammography. Ladies, if you have a DBS device in your chest and you go have a mammogram, just make sure you let them know. Because many times you can't see it, so they're not going to know unless you tell them. They just have to be a little more careful when they do the mammogram. Um, airport security. Don't lie to the TSA, but what you are going to say is, I have a pacemaker because they don't know what a deep brain stimulator is. Many of them do not know what that is. So say, I have a pacemaker. You do, you have a brain pacemaker, You're not lying to the feds. So they're probably gonna put you through the body scanner, which is extra and personally safe, because if you go through this, you'll probably set it off. And they're gonna to wanna to wand you. And we always caution you, don't be wanded, because if they hold it over your battery for a prolonged period of time, there is a chance that you can go, Ooh, and it'll shut down. Well, you can turn it back on, but you don't want to go through that. So just say, I have a pacemaker. And they'll pat you down or put you through the box. Does that mean that you should be carrying your, your little yes, device? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Time to handle the heat out here in Arizona. Fine. 
No problem. This also pertains to courthouses, sporting events, concerts, things like that. So see, body scanner is safe. You're going to set that off. So just say, I have a face scanner, no matter where you go. Uh, frequently asked questions, dental work, perfectly safe following DBS. The only caution is, you know how they use those um, ultrasonic scalers nowadays? We just don't want anybody to put one that's live on your chest. Not good. And any good dental hygienist is not going to do that. Um, you don't need antibiotic coverage either. You know, sometimes when you have a joint replacement, you have to have antibiotic coverage. You don't need that with a DBS device. EKGs. You jumped. That was great. That question you asked me. The question was, do I need to carry my patient program with me when I travel? The answer was yes. Also, whenever you go to the doctor's office, they might want to run an EKG, right? You want to turn your battery off for that 30 seconds because you could have what we call a fuzzy strip because you have electrical stimulation going on and they're trying to record this electrical stimulation in your heart and you might not have a clear strip. So take your patient programmer, you turn your device off, they run the strip, you turn it back on just like that. Um, so it's always advisable to have your patient programmer with you. Surgical procedures, again, we always advise no matter what, turn it off. Even if you're having a colonoscopy, turn it off. Other questions, what if I need emergency resuscitation? So you're walking in the mall, clutch your chest, you fall down. What is your spouse or your friend gonna do? Save your life. Don't worry if doing CPR breaks something. Don't worry if the defibrillators do something. Your life is more important. We can always replace that. Your life is more important. Never ever hesitate when you have a DBS patient that needs some resuscitation. Always have at it, save a life. Will I experience personality changes? Um, if you do, it's because of stimulation reaching out to those little areas that control your mood, or it could be from medication reduction. The most common thing we see, and we don't see it really, it's very rare, is we might see something called um, bulbar, pseudo bulbar effect. You know, somebody's watching a comedy and they burst into tears for no reason. That's called pseudo bulbar. Anyway, if you do experience any of that, just let Dr. Evidente know. So. Is DBS right for you? You have to look at the risks versus the benefits, have realistic expectations, have open discussions with your family, your friends, and your physicians, and no questions left unanswered. Don't ever think you're bothering the staff in any of the offices with a question that you think is silly. They're not silly. It's about you and your comfort, and your questions must be answered. And the keys to successful surgery, appropriate patient selection. That's Dr. Evidente's job. Accuracy of the targeting and surgical expertise, that's Dr. Ponce's job. And then patient programming and medication management with an experienced clinician, again, that's Dr. Evidente. So remember, DBS is an additional therapy for the treatment of movement disorders. It's safe, effective, and it's uh, reversible. So if there is a cure for your disease, you can just shut your device off, it won't harm you, or we can take it out, it won't harm you either. Um, DBS is an elective surgery that's designed to match your individual symptoms and needs. And DBS is not a cure, nor is it a treatment of last resort. When DBS first came out, patients were being sent for surgery too far along their disease journey and the meds weren't working. And it was just, people said, well, I've tried all this, let's do that procedure. That's not how we look at it. We wanna capture you at the right time to give you the best benefit for a long quality of life. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. What electronic devices might interrupt? The question was what electronic devices might interrupt? Uh, virtually none. I even got a call one day from a woman who was going to China and was taking a boat ride by the largest hydroelectric plant in the world. And I called the engineers at Medtronic who said, no, she's fine. She just doesn't want to go in the place. That's all. So uh, no, uh, microwave ovens, garage door openers, televisions, phones. No, everything is fine. Yeah, I, have, I have a, a tracking device for if I fall someplace. Mm -hmm. That's fine. No, nope. It uses cell phone frequency. Yeah, yeah. No, you're perfectly fine. No problems. Any other questions? Any online questions? All righty. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. And consider DBS for your uh, movement disorder symptoms.